time for Why Are You Awake? Paul Farvar here, your host. This week we have comedian Kristen Toomey. If you're not following her already, what is wrong with you? Go follow her right now on Instagram. If you're not following me, follow me on Instagram as well. If you're listening to this podcast, go over to the YouTube channel at youtube.com backslash Paul F. Comedy and watch us live. It's worth it. Subscribe to the page while you're at it. Also, go to my website, Paul F. Comedy, for upcoming dates. After Thanksgiving, I will be at Sunshine City Comedy Club in St. Petersburg, Florida that weekend. The next week, I will be at Off the Hook in Naples with Brett Ernst. And then I will be headlining Coastal Creative in St. Petersburg on December 6th. I'll be in New Orleans with my good friend Paul Ellinger as part of Two Paul's One Show on December 12th. And then I'll be back in Chicago at Rosemont Zanies as part of the third annual Parkinson's Foundation fundraiser, Stand Up for Parkinson's with Brittany Brave. Also, Blake Burkhart will be there. Make sure you get your tickets for that. All the proceeds, all the profits from that show go to Parkinson's Foundation. We're looking to beat my record last year of raising almost $20,000. Um, I'll be at Comedy Vault in Batavia later in December and then at the Comedy Plex in Oak Park for those of you asking when I'll be in the Chicagoland area. Also, check out our sponsors. Hey gang, as some of you know, I used to be a practicing lawyer in Chicago. I no longer practice, but from time to time, I need a lawyer. And when I need a lawyer, I call my friend Scott Shapiro. Scott Shapiro has been practicing law for over 25 years in Chicago. He does it all, from workers' compensation to personal injury, employment issues, and even entertainment law and contract needs. If you need a lawyer, call my friend Scott, 312-648-8800. That's 312-648-8800. Or you can email him at scott at scottshapirolegal.com. Tell him I sent you. You're welcome. It's time for another edition of Why Are You Awake? Paul Farvar here, your host. This week we have one of the greatest things to come out of Chicago, Illinois, Kristen Toomey. You like that? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Kristen. You call me a thing. Well, you are a thing. I'm a thing now. You're a brand now. Oh, boy. I'm not a good brand. I'm not good at the branding, I don't think. Why is that? I just don't feel like I'm doing a good job at it. <laughs> You're crushing it. I think it's fun. It was like one of those things to see like in the last year or two where your Instagram finally got like you just kind of blew up and it was like overnight yeah. in a way. But it wasn't you've been around forever and it was like, OK, finally, this is a lot of comedians will look at Instagram and be like, what? Like that person. And then when you do, it's like, OK, cool. Oh, good. Thank there is you. some credibility in this algorithm. Oh, thank you. Does that's, that make sense? Yeah, that's very nice. Thank you. Um, yeah, that was crazy. That was a year ago, like now it was okay. happening. And it was um, for a month, like from my birthday, which was last week, to like through to December. It was just every day, just thousands of people. Did it start just from one clip, really? Yeah, I posted... Um, a clip of like a bathroom bit that's been my closer on the road for a long time. And then that got a million. And then the second one I posted was that Gen Z joke that I had posted four other times, but this time I put it in black and white and, um, it got like over three platforms. It got 23 million. That's awesome. And it was just like every time I opened my phone, it was like, crazy. and then as a result, you got more opportunities where people are hitting you up like, Hey, come do my club and stuff like that too. Right. Yeah. I've gotten a few, um, like, you know, road gigs out of it. Uh, some clubs, mostly everything I get still is from other comedians though. Yeah. That's just been the course of my career. And I take pride in that. Cause that means something to me. If, if comedians, uh, comedians have always supported me more than, yeah. Other people. What, yeah. do you, what do you mean by other people? Then I think like comedians. Like industry? Yeah, industry or creatives. or even um, audience members, I feel, are like now kind of responding to me in a way th that comedians have always been. I disagree. I feel like you've always had the response from the audience. Oh, in the room, 100%. Okay. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm not saying like, I, yeah, no, in the room for sure. Because there's, there's just, certain comics that play to the back of the room yeah. that are like, I just want to make my friends laugh. No, I don't do that. You don't do that, but you still make 
the people in the back of the room laugh. Yeah, that's huge. That's the for best me. combination, from in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. Um, that's not what I meant. I meant um, just like every every gig I get, like the cool things that I get. It's other comedians pushing my name forward. It's right. them booking me themselves, or it's them really advocating for me in a way that um, I don't do myself for myself. You know, I'm not able to do it like that for myself, but. Um, so I, I appreciate the support and it, and it is good to see you get that, but you also have that now that you have the, uh, the credibility of social media or whatever, you'll see more and more opportunities coming your way, which you should have been getting a long time ago. Thank you. So in my opinion, but yeah, it's been, it'll be 16 years, uh, doing up this month. Yeah. I feel like the numbers help a little bit, you know, when like after a set, an audience member will come up and say like, what's your Instagram? And I put it in and I see them respond to the number yeah, a little cool, bit. Yeah. yeah. So, um, I feel like that validates their impression. Uh, it is weird, this new currency that we have, mm-hmm. um, how much it does matter, you know, the engagement, kind of messes with you because you're like okay i have all these people following but like 500 people are seeing it so it's like what's going on um they keep changing it yeah uh, i've hired people to help me figure stuff out why am i getting shadow banned and they're like well it's not shadow banned. you're just getting pushed to the bottom Mm -hmm. you have to do things to get it back up and like just post every day i'm like well i'm not gonna do that yeah and then it's like what do you post and then you know you post something i lost a like 10,000 followers in three days because I posted some political yeah, thing. Yeah, I did that too. And At some point, I'm like, I don't give a shit. Right, yeah. And so it's like you don't want to tank your career based on a political party per That really se. isn't going to affect you in the long run, yeah. But I know personally as, an, as a fan of comedy, as a fan of artists, I feel like the people that are being quiet about it, I'm losing respect for them for not saying something. So in the past, I was always... Uh, fearful of losing my base but then recently i did a show where the crowd was like aligned with me uh not necessarily politically but just like education wise or whatever yeah. you want to say not background not, yeah or... just like it, it was an ann arbor comedy club yeah. and it was the best weekend i've ever had they were just well-read people which mm. is what i want and so after that weekend i was like i don't give a shit anymore i'm gonna tailor my audience to be people that are like me Mm. after the other election i did something where i just explained the law to people i just Mm. i was like hey this is how election law works and then you know people will be like oh you're a fucking liberal i'm like no i'm a lawyer that actually handled election law cases yeah for both republicans and democrats wow so like i know know the law yeah that's i defended municipalities for for years yeah see all these fucking yeah i do see all those we always Plans. have to reference that at one time in the podcast. So I think because I got all of those followers so quickly off basically one video that when I did post what I posted, which, you know, I got some messages like, oh, good luck going woke. And I'm like, <laughs> you don't know me at all. Like if anyone knows me, it's like. That's I've always been that way. I grew up with gay people in my house partying yeah. when I was seven. Like that's been my life. So it's funny that you think like I'm trying to sell out by going woke. It's like no, if I was selling yeah. out, I would be like, okay, you know, to yeah, whatever yeah, yeah. bullshit you're saying. That's another thing. Like you mentioned just now, who you want your audience to be yeah. and to think about. And I think that's why I'm not good at branding because I don't think about that. I think that is honestly something I should really work on is thinking like, who am I talking to? Who do I want to be talking to? Because I think just working in every type of room you can possibly imagine for the past 16 years that I don't really have a say on who I'm in front of. And so I'm just doing me and that's it and if you like it that's awesome i don't really have a i don't think you need to have person in mind that i'm talking to i I don't think you have to i think you are blessed with the fact that what you talk about on stage appeals to so many people you don't really need a demographic because what you talk about is just broadly accepted and it's it is because you have you have If you take a Venn diagram of all the different things that you touch upon, Mm. you are a mom, you are Gen X, you are uh, a woman um, in her, you know, 30s and 40s. Mm. You're you're touching so many things that 
of people that go to comedy clubs that buy tickets to comedy clubs like yeah. we talked about yeah. the other day that it's you're gonna win no matter what i feel like uh, when i go on the you road need with a, a niche i you need, need a niche something. yeah because i'm not as funny as you so i'm like <laughs> i need to <laughs> oh, wow <laughs> well also i think that like what i think is funny is not is not like uh the normal i love going to these shows like you said i don't get to choose who i yeah. perform with but, but if i did my set that i wanted to do it wouldn't be it wouldn't do as well as what i'm catering to their crowd because yes, i, feel I want them to like me yeah yeah i that feel yeah that does make sense i mean you want to do the job that you're hired to do you know what i mean right. and i think you know when you're opening for somebody that's clean and you're doing their theater show you don't want to go in there and you know slap your puss or whatever yeah, like i would do like i do yeah. yeah for me i've been sort of lucky to really not have any guardrails on what I'm supposed to be doing and I don't like I have one show coming up that I have to do seven minutes clean it's for a fundraiser the person that booked me is an is another comedian that's trusting me to do this and obviously I think because it's a comedian that we both know and respect Mm -hmm. I'm excited for the challenge to do it and and I most Seven of my stuff is not clean? that dirty. Yeah. I mean, I can do that. No problem. I can think of yeah. five bits right now. Had sort of just an attitude. I think because comedians in my station, I don't get paid a lot and I don't get uh, a lot of say in what I'm doing and where I'm working. And yeah. um, a lot of the times I'm doing this shit for free or way underpaid. And so my thought was, okay, well, at least when I'm up there, I can do whatever the fuck I want and I can say whatever the fuck I want and that's enough pay for me is that these people have to listen to me. Being a woman in the way that I was raised in a lot of ways in my life, it was like my opinion didn't really matter. So anytime someone took that from me and was like, you can't say this or that or this or you can't talk about these things, I was like, I don't even want to do it because that's what I'm doing this for. To express yourself yes yeah and so if anybody puts any restriction on that i would get very uh bristled Re- rebellious yeah and rebellious about it exactly and even if it was for you know you can make so much money doing clean comedy and corporate stuff mm-hmm. and i would just be like you know what i'd rather doordash i'd rather do anything and i did doordash and it's terrible before i had followers has or that anything, changed now i think i'm chilled out enough now that I have those gigs where I can do that, but I would like to actually do this gig and maybe a few more. You know, it's seven minutes and just flex that muscle, work that muscle yeah, of it. It is in, fun. And for my own tool belt and for my own growth as a comedian, not for money grab or not for anything but my own personal growth. I was just talking to somebody about this uh, gig that it, it pays really well, but it's for a site that I don't really... Uh, agree with oh, on, yeah. a, on a feminist kind of sure. moral whatever I just don't f- like it yeah. and it's quite a bit of money but I thought you know thousand dollars is not a lot of money if you are not proud of how you made it and the thing about money that you get like that the money that you get quickly cheaply and for something that you are not proud of you end up spending that money so quickly you, nothing good comes out of that kind of money do you know the band the tragically hip no okay so they were a band in in canada there's a documentary on amazon they were the, they were like our for canada they were like bruce springsteen but oh, when wow. they came to america they weren't known they were doing like martyrs in smaller rooms but there they were doing theaters everyone's like why aren't they so big they could be so much bigger but when you watch the documentary, you see that they have this moral compass that they're like, like they were going to do a deal with Tower Records. Tower Records is going to give them $2 million. They're going to give them every show, every Tower Records in like 2000, whatever. Their stuff would be plastered on all the walls in mm-hmm. America. And they were just like, nah, we kind of like the local record store and Tower kind of fucked them over. Yeah. And they didn't do it. And people at the time were like, you guys are fucking crazy. But now in hindsight, they're like, Yeah. Because that's just who they are. Yeah. You got to sleep with yourself at the end of the day. And that money, I'm telling you, it's like I've taken money like that before in my life. And that money 
doesn't lead to good things. It, it really doesn't. Well, it depends on if you if it's something that affects your moral compass. I think in the in the eighties and nineties, people would say bands were sellouts mm. because they had music on their commercials. But mm-hmm. now that's how people discover music. Wilco st- got huge because they were doing Volkswagen commercials. Like oh, everyone's like, "Who's that song?" That. I didn't know that. Yeah. Don't ruin it. Well, no, but I feel that way. I don't like is- to see. I love Jeff Tweedy and I love Wilco, but I don't like to see bands that I like. I understand it's exposure, but I don't like songs that I love being used as a car jingle. I don't. I I understand that that's the culture nowadays, and that the most popular Jack Harlow has a KFC box of bat chicken or whatever, and it's no one cares. But I still care. I think that yeah, you're you know, Gen X. That's we were we were taught to think that was selling out. Yeah, I just feel like, and I don't even need to use that term, but it's just for me. I don't like it, you know. And so I gotta my career is my whole life. That's my whole yeah. life, and it's long, you know. God, I hope. Hopefully, yeah. hopefully, I have to. You know, you don't want to take. A money grab now that you're gonna f- regret i face that all the time when i have situations like that and i'll have like commercials that i have to do for acting and stuff like that yeah. and i'm like well i don't really like that company so there is a line that you can draw where you're like How, yeah. what's the value to me and if it's six thousand dollars or if it's like this is how much it's worth it for me to feel better about doing it because you're taking money from people that you disagree with at least you're bankrupting them a little bit mm-hmm. and that, then you can use that money for good i mean there's a lot of ways to justify it um yeah well but you're yeah, a lawyer at the end well no i mean i am <laughs> but i'm also gymnastics. like but yeah, I, no, for I would real. never do like people ask me if i would do uh there was a guy who had a show a huckabee show huckabee was a governor of arkansas who i fucking couldn't stand mm-hmm. they were sending emails like hey what comedians want to be on there i'm like that's the one show I won't do. Mm-hmm. I mean, I probably do Gutfeld because you can go there and shit on him a little bit. Yeah, I mean, there's <laughs> yeah, there's just certain things you don't want to do. Yeah, I, get I it. think um, some gigs, you know, you take for the opportunity, some for the hang that other comedians right. are with. Some you do it because it's a fun venue or location that you want to travel to. Some it's for the money, you know. But I think whatever you're taking you've got to be able to justify it and some of the stuff feels bad you have to be able to yeah that drive home if that, you're doing something just for money <laughs> is oh, yeah. rough or even if you don't do it for money there's that drive home that sucks anyway yeah but the flip side of that is when you are very creative and you want to do just shows you want to do you're doing sometimes you're doing those shows for 12 people and it is fun 100 percent. i just did that the other day it's it is fun but Tonight? then you're like afterwards where you're Tonight? getting Well, that's different. You didn't have to travel by plane to Tulsa, Oklahoma. There's a line that you're like, where you have to navigate that. And that's why I always want a manager to be like, when I was managing bands, I could be like, okay, this is, I would be able to explain it to everyone. I don't have that anymore because I'm always like, you can always ask comedians like, how was this show? Unless you have a manager. Oh, you manage bands? Oh yeah. All these bands in here. Really? Yeah. After I played in bands and I realized I wasn't good, I just started managing them. (laughs) That's what I did with Shushan Boy Productions. Yeah. Oh, cool. I remember the day I met you. Oh my gosh, when? Um, it was well, a long time ago. The first time we talked, uh, I met you at uh, Rena's uh, Three Rena Dead Moose? and Drake's Three Dead Moose open mic. Mm. But then we did a, a mic at Sully's, I think. On Sully's, Clark, the one that Kyle Scanlon. Oh right? yeah. I had just started comedy. I think it was like my fifth or sixth open mic. And you came up to me like, that was really funny, the joke about your dad or whatever joke I did. Aww. And I was like, oh, cool. Like, that was the coolest thing because you were like one of the, you and Megan Gailey were like super nice to me. Aww, so I always was nice. like, that's cool. But I also used that as an example of, I hope she was being sincere because sometimes comedians will be like, and we've talked about this on the show before where I'll see a comedian like, say good set to someone that just bombed like don't say that you're an established comedian they're going to remember that for the rest of their life no i do think when i see someone that's new and i must have known that you were new or i was just listening but i do like to encourage people that are new and that i find funny or said something funny i do go up to people especially if it's a a woman to be honest um and you know um no (laughs) (laughs) and bitch boys um, yeah yeah yeah, um no i do like to encourage new comedians that have something about like one joke or something their presence is good i do like to encourage people i think a lot of people might have a similar story about that if you'd ask them 
yeah, I always, I'm always nice to people that I think are good. Yeah. On the flip side, though, I'll never. I'm, I'm trying to end the. Yeah, good set when it wasn't. I, I'm trying to so end that hard. from people to. to yeah, do. I. You know what? I had a imposter syndrome like breakdown a couple years ago. How many times have you said good set when it, you weren't even listening in the room? That's so what, it's like. So, are you basing your value as a comedian on other people's good set? Well, that's good different. Set. If they had a good set because of the crowd response i'm just saying in my own mind that really sent me down a spiral because but it did that in with a purpose because i think that i got to the point where i mean through paranoia and drug use and all that which i'm sober now but i got to a point where i didn't trust anybody at all Mm -hmm. like even like nobody and um which is a really scary and isolating dark place to be but what comes out of that hopefully and what did is okay well what do I think? And yeah. I'm a person, my opinion counts. I'm one, one person. So one person thinks that I'm funny and that's really all that you need is one. So it's like, well, I mean, it's no, different it, for you, but what if there's someone that has no self-awareness and they think they're funny and they're bombing continuously and then someone like yeah. you comes along and says, hey, good set. You it just validates. validated yeah. bad behavior. But he, listen, if they think they're funny, and they're doing what they need to do. They're expressing themselves and doing all the things that we are doing. But it's just not working for them for whatever reason. Who are we to say, like, you shouldn't be doing that? If they have the the delusion to keep getting up there and doing it over and over again. And honestly, we all started out that way. Everyone yeah. that does comedy and does any kind of art is delusional at some point. Sure. To, to get the, the balls to even do it in the first place, you have to be a little delusional. And then hopefully talent and hard work and repetition and all of that kicks in and you develop a skill set that is palatable to other people. If that never happens and you're still content, I mean, there's plenty of people that we both know that just do open mics and mm-hmm. they've done just pretty much open mics for a decade or longer. Mm-hmm. You know, who are they hurting by doing that? It's an open mic, you know. Themselves. But maybe they're not. Maybe that's our, because we would be hurting ourselves if we were doing that. But Mm -hmm. to them, that's all they need. Sure. They work at a warehouse and then afterwards they go drink beer and they get up and they tell fart jokes. It's their freedom. Yeah, sure. It's their expression. Yeah. Yeah, They want to call themselves a comedian. Let them, I mean, that doesn't take anything from me. You know what I mean? Like, I agree with that. If it's a harmless situation like that, the only time I disagree with that is when there is this, you're encouraging bad behavior, the clubs, all of a sudden you're at the point where these people are taking, like, for example, I had a club that they're like, Hey, who do you want to open for you? And I was like, Oh, it doesn't matter. And then they put someone in front of you and they're not good. And Mm. they kind of, ruin the show and then the person has no self-awareness that he's like hey if you ever need an opener i'll take you on the road i'm like did you just not realize how bad you did that's there there are people doing that yeah and that is really annoying and frustrating to Mm -hmm. watch and i've had that recently and there's been many times where i've vented in my car alone after (laughs) such of an experience where i was like you fucking suck you know but um what am I going to do? Tell hurt their feelings? No, I don't say, think you have to you know, hurt their feelings. My just point don't is, say don't good encourage job. bad. Yeah, yeah, that's it. yeah, yeah. That's the one thing that take away from. But this that's podcast. yeah, and I absolutely have tried since that like um, revelation. I've tried to do that. It's very awkward to avoid the good set what at someone, times. You someone know? said it's like, how'd you, how did you f- how do you feel? Is what people say if yeah. they say that to you. It's like if they say, oh, that was tough then at least they know they didn't do know, well. And, and maybe it was just a bad set. You know? That I feel like maybe they don't care for my comedy or whatever. But I've had people when I got off stage and the crowd response was good, you know. How did that feel? And I'm like, I don't like you asking me that. Like, Well, maybe they didn't mean it in a way that was negative. You think it's all automatically it, it negative? Yeah, I think it is. Because even with the crowd's positive response, that question implies... See, I... That made me feel like really that bothered me more than like someone saying nothing. It I would rather you say how nothing. They say it. Like if I like I've said that to people after they've murdered, I'd be like, how does that feel? Like to be like, isn't that the best? Isn't this the greatest yeah, job we have that, in the world? But that that wasn't the tone. That wasn't of the it. tone. It was like, how did that feel? No, it was just like, <laughs> how did that feel? Like just kind of like a flat tone, and I'm like, you know, 
just don't say anything. Yeah. I, I don't need you to say anything. I don't sure. need anybody to say anything, which is fucked up of me, but I really don't. Like, if you want to say something, I will take that in and I will be grateful for it and, and probably give you a compliment right back or a hug, you know, thank you. But I would, I don't need fake gassed up. I don't need bullshit and I don't need any sure. sideways comments. Don't say anything, you know, let me just walk, go up home let me go home <laughs> <laughs> leave me alone yeah you said you started 16 years ago how did you decide to do comedy you were married you had your kids and this was like your escape to do mm-hmm. st- but how did you know to be like i want to do stand up and not you know other pta com- or something no well not <laughs> <laughs> i meant like comedy related things but yeah pta too I guess. um well i was a young mom and i always wanted to do comedy like growing up in chicago i you know, glorified SNL and I would um, like drive by when I got my license, I would like drive by Second City and um, just to like be by it. And then I didn't really, you know, I saw Paula Poundstone when I was eight and um, I snuck into her show at COD, College of DuPage and watched from the catwalk upstairs. And that was really cool. I saw her doing crowd work and I thought like it was like a magician. It was awesome. And um, eight years old. Wow. Yeah. I didn't know people could do that. Like, I'm like, she doesn't have a script. Like, she's just, you know, <laughs> it was incredible. So funny. Um, so that stuck with me. But then it was more about, you know, SNL was like what most sure. people think of comedy. Everybody came from Second City, which I grew up here. So I'm thinking like, oh, okay, so I'm going to go to Second City someday. That was like, you know, I dropped out of high school and um, like never succeeded at anything that I ever tried. That new joke you do where you tell the the path of your life is so fucking awesome. Oh, thank you. It's new, right? Yeah, that's okay. new. Yeah. Because I saw you do it a couple of times. Yeah. It's yeah. And I like it's growing in any way. But yeah. Thank you. I don't want to ruin it for people to go watch it. That was always in my mind. Like I wanted to do Second City, but I was really, I had stage fright. I had done some theater, but I never had very many lines. I was always kind of like In small. high school you did theater? As a kid, okay. um, my mom was uh, an assistant director at College of DuPage, which is how I snuck into Paula Poundstone. Like, I grew up around theater kids. My mom housed a bunch of gay kids that got kicked out of their house. So that oh, they wow, came to our really? house. And it was just like theater parties, and that was just how I grew up. There were kids like your age or like older? No, older. So I was like seven. They were 19, 18, 20. So I just grew up with a bunch of theater people, you know? They, like throw me in a play with like one line uh in the college plays so then in high school I did my friend Lisa directed a one act and I did that but I never got cast in anything because I was very nervous and shy during auditions did not audition well still don't so then I uh I went I got my GED and then I went to College of DuPage for one quarter only and I was in a play there I was Giggly Dwarf and Joe White and the Seven Dwarves Okay. Okay. And then I dropped out of that. I took ceramics and philosophy. That was all I took. So I wasn't like, <laughs> I don't know what I was. And then I was in a play. And then um, I got married. Like I was bartending and I got pregnant. We got married. So then I had my daughter and, you know, as this housewife. How old were you when you had your daughter? 22. Okay. You know, I never planned on getting married and having kids. I planned on becoming, you know, a sketch comedian. Now I'm in this housewife in Elmhurst with a baby and a husband. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, I'm reading every book I could get my hands on. She was about two. And I said, you know, I really want to do this thing. And he was like, well, how much is it? And I was like, I think it's like $300. And it's every Sunday for a couple hours. And he was like, yeah, all right. Which is great, because I don't think I had the money on my own anyway. So I started doing that. Doing Second City classes? Yeah. A3 improv. Improv, yeah. Then I got cast in a sketch show there, which was really good. I was really proud of that. I auditioned for a conservatory. I didn't get into it. But I got pregnant with my son. So then I had him. I took the pregnancy off of comedy and just had him and then someone in my comedy class who's not funny at all he was like the least funny person in the class he was doing um an open mic at cigars and stripes in berwin and i saw on facebook he was like doing stand-up comedy at this open mic and i was like if he can do it i can do it so i brought a bunch of my friends and we went and i got a little tipsy and then i got up and i had a really good set and the guy booked me and i went Uh back Off of your first open mic set. Yeah. But then I bombed really bad. That's how it always is. 
And then about 60 people from high school came to my second open mic at Sylvie's. Oh, God, I forgot. About and I brought Sylvie's. 60 people. Yeah. And I bombed. It was horrible. I yeah. completely bombed. And then I bombed a couple more times. And then I was like, forget it. <laughs> and then the economy crashed and I um, got a job bartending and the guy at the, the bar owner heard that I had done stand up a few times. He wanted me to op- host an open mic there. So I started back up in 2010, really. And then I was very serious about it. So I did A&E, A3, and then I did the conservatory. But then I was like, fuck this. I the audition. It. So on the conservatory I audition. Failed the, I didn't get in the first time, but the second time I did get in. I think I would have done better a second time. Yeah. The first time, the problem. See, I feel like I'm meant for stand-up because the sketch show was good. But then during the audition, I got a laugh. Yeah. But I broke the fourth wall. Like I I looked right at them. Yeah. You know what I mean? When they're laughing. I think the thing about improv that bothered me was the fact that kind of, you'd have a vision of where the scene is going and then someone would just derail it. And it right. was just not like it would irritate me because it's not funny or something or it's not adding something. It's not moving it forward. It's just like side swipe. I think I like the control of stand up yeah. where it's like, yeah, if it sucks, it's my fault. If it does well, it's my doing. Right. It's really strange. I never thought in my whole life that I would be this alone. I was very like codependent on people my right. whole life, just really leaning heavy on friends. So it's interesting now. Like, I mean, I, I don't even think I could have been on stage alone most of my life and it's weird to think like now i i drive hours by myself go into a place i've never been get up there perform alone and then leave it's weird i never thought i would be doing that comedy was never on my vision board as a kid i thought a band yeah i thought i was gonna be a band i thought i was gonna be a a politician that was a thing i was like i'm gonna be a one-hit wonder and then i use that credibility to run for senate like like uh, what's his name, Beto O'Rourke from yeah. from Texas. I was like, that's what I was gonna do. Comedy was never on my radar, but then at the same time, but now I can't think of how it could be any other way. I know, that's what I'm saying. How quickly you adjust it just, and it becomes so normal. I feel like some people are concerned, probably, about the amount of time that I'm alone. You talk about that on stage, where you're like your your kids are worried about you choking Falling. alone on yeah. food yeah that's what my mom used to say as a thing when i was single she's like your dad found me when i yeah. fell it was a joke i used yeah, to do yeah. and that's a true story and it's like you need to find someone so when you fall someone can call the police i'm like yeah. well i mean there's cell phones now mm-hmm. you know you just call <laughs> yeah i mean it is a thought but um also i've been with a lot of people when they die and it's usually they're alone anyway we all die alone even if you're married right unfortunately <laughs> You talked about now you're after the shows you are you're driving home. What are you doing after your sets like late at night? Are you because you're sober too? Mm. Well, and the other thing is my diet is so restrictive now that it's like I can't even really go get food. What's I'm, your diet? See, I have celiac, so no gluten, no dairy. I don't eat fried food um, because it's usually mixed with gluten. So you can't even get food after your show. No, in, like, if I'm on the towns. road, like my best friend Meg, who lives out of state, but we talk multiple times a day she'll be like oh you're on the road so you're basically living on like a bird like nuts and and berries berries. there's certain places i know have been vetted around chicago that i can eat but when i'm out of town i don't want to risk it because the show will be ruined and also it's like yeah so basically i don't even get to like go out to eat it's mostly kind bars or something like that i'll do my set say like shake hands whatever and then I just go back to the hotel. I don't watch TV, so... It's just in silence, staring <laughs> silence. at the, the roof. <laughs> yeah. I'll watch, like, uh, live music on YouTube. Scroll. Um, lately, I've been watching, like, <laughs> some history. Jessica Fletcher, Murder, She Wrote. <laughs> on my phone. <laughs> on your phone? <laughs> Not even on the... You know hotels have, like, every channel sometimes? No, I don't like TV. Murder, She Wrote's not TV. It's it was Murder, on, She Wrote. It was on TV. No. It's probably... It's some, It's its own campy thing that I like to see in a small, in a small screen in my hand. Are you creative late at night? Are you writing ever after shows or no? No, I just started journaling again. I don't really write comedy. What I do is I 
think of something, I write down like the idea in my notes, you know, yeah, that's how I- and then I riff it out. I like to paint, but I can't do that on the road. I'll do that at home. I'll play solitaire with a deck of cards um, at home and abroad. You're like a comedian in 1947. <laughs> like, you know that you have all these things that you can do. And look, I... <laughs> like a pioneer as I was, woman. As I was thinking about what... Sometimes when I ask me is what they do after their show, I'm thinking of ways... What do that they I could, say? What I could learn from them. But then as soon as I ask you, I'm like, oh, she's not going to be able to help me at all. <laughs> Because I know, I know about all your fucking weird. They usually go out, but I, I again, do they really? Yeah, a lot of people do. I don't. I can't write after a show or listen to my set. I think no. that's lunacy. Yeah, but some it is productive. I am productive after shows. What I'll do is because you're wired. I've got that energy. You just did an hour or whatever. I'll work out at the gym, oh, nice. which is crazy. I, I think a lot of people think that's crazy, but then I get to work out. I eat for sure. I don't have a restrictive diet. Mm-hmm. What and do you eat? Like ideally healthy. No, oh, I like okay. to eat healthy. But if you're like in Waterford Township, you're yeah. going to the whatever bar that's open and bar food. But yeah. you can always find something kind of healthy. And then what I also do is I'll send emails out to mm, clubs and stuff. That's good. I get a lot of booking emails sent at that time, like in the middle of the night. People yeah. are just up in this business. But You've been sober how long now? Four years. Okay, so let's talk about when you weren't sober. What were you doing after the shows? Without getting, getting kicked out of strip clubs. And, really? Yeah. Were there times where you're like, I should have gone home? I was doing a show in Gary, Indiana. Oh, God. Everyone has a story from Gary, Indiana, but go ahead. Sorry. The crowd, I don't even know what it was. But I was drinking and talking to everybody after. And I said, we're go-. somebody's like, we're going to the strip club. And I say to everybody, we're going to the strip club. And so this guy's got a pickup truck. And there's a picture on Instagram somewhere of me. I'm on the back of the pickup truck. Like, come on. And the whole audience is walking down the street like a parade to the strip club. We get in the strip club. I'm drinking. I start making out with a guy. And I get like, you can't be doing, you got to leave. You can't be giving it away for free in here like that. <laughs> so oh got kicked God. out of a Gary strip club. And I was like, oh boy, that's, um, <laughs> I don't know. That's like on my Girl Scout badge of Loserville, I think. I don't know. It could be way worse, but gross. yeah, that's pretty I bad. mean, it's been way worse. That's pretty that's mild. The, that's the one that you're allowed on this podcast yeah. for. Yeah. Um, but it's just a lot of like, you know hooking up with people and feeling gross about that. I feel like I tried to do that because I didn't try, but I allowed that to happen because I felt like that's what you're supposed to do. Mm-hmm. And um like tried it out and it was just it just doesn't suit Icky. me. Yeah, it doesn't well, suit st- me. we were talking about that at a show recently after yeah. a show about dating and stuff. It's like, yeah, I think when you get to a certain level, well, see, you're different cuz I feel like and now it's turning into singles only podcast again, but <laughs> You you got married so young. Most people in your situation, after they get divorced, they go the opposite way. And they just like, like on the dating apps, I'd, I'd meet women who recently got divorced. I'm like, hey, I know what you think is going to happen, but I'm not, I'm going to be your guru here. I'm going to tell you, these guys that are saying this shit are all lying to you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like they just want to fuck you. And they're like, well, why don't you want to fuck me? I'm like, because I don't, I don't need to. You're like, to. I do, but I'm- I do, but I don't want to deal with the the aftermath <laughs> yeah so did you go through your whole phase a li- you did a little bit i remember yeah briefly. i mean i wouldn't even call i wouldn't even really call it that because uh like numbers wise i think it was like three four yeah, that's not, is that a whole no phase? that's not a whole phase but i mean there was some hooking up you know making out whole behavior but <laughs> um numbers wise it wasn't like a, a catastrophe or anything yeah. but um yeah, just every time it just wasn't for me. So that's kind of isolating in some ways. In some ways it's like, oh, well, you know, I just, I don't really get the same thing out of it that other people seem to be getting out of it. Did you, when you were in high school, were you like that? Were you like a partier? No, like sex wise? Sex wise. Or no. Just drinking? I was, yeah. I mean, I was doing heroin at 14. What? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. I was stealing cars and doing heroin at 14. In Villa Park? Yeah. I didn't even know that they Well, were. I mean, we would I would drive other people's car at 14 with no license yeah, down to 90. Yeah. And I would get off on Independence and I would buy heroin and then turn around, snort it and come back and put their keys back in their locker and go to fifth period. 
I mean, that's, Jesus Christ. Yeah, 14. So, I mean, I was into that because I started partying when I was seven. Yeah. I was seven years old when I was I started partying. So by 14, I was already... You're like the Drew Barrymore of, of College of DuPage. Right. So <laughs> now by the time I hit 37, uh, I was, I'm done with partying. Like yeah. I, I, I've done everything that you can do and still be alive. So I'm like, right now, honestly, a good time for me is Wordle, coffee, crossword puzzles, painting murder she wrote murder she wrote in the background just for some background noise <laughs> or a concert you know wilco i watch them candles lit i got plants now i'm like just calm i want i want peace i want calm um serenity is really what does it for me i take two bath bubble baths a day oh i love it Did you take a shower after no you I know use bath, Eps, epsom salt i know but you are a renter, right? It's my house. I mean, my mom owns it. She bought it from my ex-husband. Okay, but that bath has been used for... I've cleaned the bath. I clean it regularly. You're in your own filth. How am I filthy if I'm bathing two times a day with salt? I don't know. I just think baths are not clean. Maybe your asshole's not clean. Well, your asshole's cleaner, you think? Yes. If I'm bathing twice a day, okay, so the first took a bath... bath <laughs> I haven't taken a bath <laughs> since 87. But, but I, I've had this discussion. People think baths are gross. I don't. Okay, so I'm a bath the first bather. bath you're taking, mm. you your asshole isn't clean. Well, then I'm sitting in it. Yeah, and then it's it's you're then in the water. Then the second one gets rid of it. Okay, but the time between the first and the second one, you have ass fucking germs all over your body, up to your neck. Don't you think that the salt kills that? <laughs> you know what's in the ocean? People bathe in the ocean. Yeah, people that don't have showers. There's a bath gets you clean, honestly. Mm. I don't I don't get in with an ass full of shit. It's not like I'm sitting down with <laughs> an ass full of shit. We're talking the- about microscopic fecal matter is on everything. That's if you want to really talk about it. That's true. And honestly, if you're getting out of a shower and you're touching anything, you've got fecal matter on you almost immediately. That's true. But so I what's the difference? Hands. I so I wash my it. hands. You saw me I when saw I came you, in. Yeah, yeah. I wash them con- I constantly. But the fact that you're clean in that department that you have like. I'm wa- so clean all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Except the, the bath thing. Do you take showers? Ever? Yeah. Okay. Especially if I have to wash my hair, I take a shower. But every day is not a wash hair day. Do you take baths in hotels? No. Okay. All right. Then we're. Disgusting. Fine. At least you understand. That's people's feet. At least you understand that there's a line. Yeah. You just feel that in your bath. I was bath, in Soho House in Nashville. It was a gorgeous coffee yeah, yeah, yeah. tub, and I still wouldn't take a bath in there. Well, there's the baths in Vegas. Like they have. Oh, they're like, I'm no. like, there's no fucking. I don't way. like touching things in the room. I have to bring wipes. I mean, I'm very conscious. So I worked on a COVID unit in a nursing home during sure. the outbreak. I mean, that really, I was always kind of conscious about it, aside from the heroin and stuff. But like, <laughs> <laughs> it really made me, I mean, I, I like annoy my kids about it, like the hand washing and like watching people's like, okay, you just touched that and now you're touching your mouth or you're touching something that's going to go in your mouth. I'm very conscious of it. So you're doing heroin at 14. You're Drew Barrymore at seven. Um, <laughs> were you were you just doing this by yourself, or do you have like a crew of your friends in high school that were like that? Yeah, I had your um, age. I had uh, my best friend Kristen. She passed away now, but um, she passed away in, during the pandemic. But um, her and I would do this together, and then I was able to quit. I got sent to rehab because I had a closet full of cell phones that she had stolen um <laughs> in 1995 which no one had a cell phone so sure we had no money and then my mom opened my closet and there was like 12 cell phones from a in store there. yeah oh. so i had to answer for that and got sent to rehab which um my dad paid cash so there wouldn't be a, a trail i quit doing heroin but then you know i was doing a lot of other drugs and i did try it again a few times um and she kept doing it unfortunately she couldn't stop and she was in and out of prison yeah. for the rest of her life and i actually performed in front of her in prison she was in the front row and a couple other friends that were doing it, yeah. a lot of them passed away unfortunately 
then like my other friends would just drink, you know, and was like a lot of drinking, pot smoking. It really became when I was a mom, it was drinking. I didn't smoke pot. I stopped smoking pot about 20 because I was getting panic attacks from it. Like all, I was the first person to have kids and be married out of all my friends. And so um, I would go out with them like one or two nights a week and I would just get like blacked Shit out. Yeah. yeah. And you were working at a bar after that too. Yeah. A lot of drinking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do you find it hard now that you've been sober four years? Like for me, it is weird to not drink after shows, but I also kind of like it. Yeah. Have you come to that point where you don't miss it anymore? I, I, don't, I haven't missed it. Okay. The whole time. I mean, honestly, it's very clear for me and those people that know me well that it just doesn't suit me. If you, you know, n- know me, um, if you've met me drunk or drinking, it's like a different person. And it's I not... I have videos of you drunk. Yeah, yeah. And it's just not... It's never, you know, a positive thing. And so uh, it's a very negative thing in my life. It's been a kind of... Um, I think that's Something what everybody. I started doing very young that I didn't really, uh, it didn't serve me well. So there's been good things that have come out of it, but more bad things than good. There's nothing that I miss. I felt like shit. I acted like an asshole. Bad things happened to me because I didn't have my guard up and bearings, yeah. my bearings. And so there's nothing to miss. I mean, yeah. there's just feeling like hungover and just wasn't for I me. also think there is a way to prove that when people, especially in our field, that get sober, good things happen to them. You look at some of the comedians that were very successful. Mm-hmm. Their success started when they were sober. Yes. And, and, or and, they're dead now. <laughs> right. Because if you can't sustain this no. lifestyle if you keep drinking like Mm-mm. that. I mean, my doctor basically told me. either quit drinking at some point or you die. That's just what happens when you're <laughs> doing it like this. I'm not talking about like the person that has no. a couple glasses of wine. I'm saying when you're getting paid in alcohol. You you can't sustain it. It doesn't last unless you make a change. You can't just like yeah. continue. Like you said, you'll die. Mm-hmm. And there's history of that. Many. If people. you watch the the Vice thing, I know it's on television, but <laughs> I've heard of it. The Vice <laughs> thing about uh, comedy being like the, the dark side of comedy. They they follow like Greg Giraldo, Freddie Prince, uh, Maria Bamford, all these comedians who had these demons and stuff. You're like, oh yeah, this is why they're all sober or dead. Yeah, I just heard, uh, and weed for me. I I have a reaction to weed. It's like brings out psychosis in me literally it does the same thing to my brother and that's just something in our genetics it doesn't really fit that really opened up like i had sort of a mystical religious you know end of the world panic really crisis and pot. pot and it was like really scary stuff like you're talking about facing demons i mean that's literally what it felt like i was going yeah. through that experience and um my perception of reality was completely different than it is today and than it was, you know, in years prior. But, um, and that type of thing is really sobering as well because that going from that terrified state of not knowing what reality, you know, you're out of your mind and it's really, it's beyond having a good time. I mean, it's not, nobody's no, having a good time. It's going not fun that. anymore. You're right. medicating yourself and then you're also making it worse. You're I mean, making it worse. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's, that's It's like, I'm on fire. Let <clears throat> me just keep dumping <laughs> gasoline on myself. Is there what, were what friends of mine for years. My friends who, uh, who, uh, had problems with, they were medicating themselves on drugs and there were certain drugs that once we all did, we experimented with stuff. They, some people never came back normal. Like, yes. It affects you. There's a permanence like that to it. Too. Yeah. And um, thank God, you know, I um, was able to come back from that. I'm just grateful that I'm here right now as I am because I do know people that never did come back. Look at look at what's happened to you in the last year. I mean, yeah. you're blowing up. You're finally getting the attention you deserve. And Thank you. And uh, it's only going to go up from here unless you, you know comes out that you were a nazi at some point in your life <laughs> never been a nazi you, you don't might have not to remember about that. <laughs> yeah well i mean there could so somebody could address me up when i was asleep for sure um wh- so what would you have done tonight if you didn't do a podcast after this show it's late night i'm in town i would go or what are you gonna do now you're gonna go take your second epsom salt i might bath. take another third it would be my third Jesus today Jesus christ 
I might take a third bubble bath because you know what I really like to do? I got a fan, like a hand fan, and I think I'm going to just start bringing it with me and I'm going to be that person. On stage? Maybe. But I take it really hot where I'm like going to pass out hot and then I go and lay on my bed and I fan myself. <laughs> Instead of a towel? No, I use a towel. Towel and the fan. But I just... I can imagine it right now. And then I go to sleep. Then that's how I feel. With a towel on? Yeah. No. So nice. I can't wait. Now I'm so excited to go home. Dear God. That's what I'm going to do. Well, we, we went over time. I apologize to me. Thank you, Kristen, for doing the podcast. Uh, where can people find out more about you and your upcoming shows? Well, I have to update my website. So that's kristentoomey.live. But just find me on Instagram. I'm really active on that one. I'm not really on TikTok. There's some people that have fake accounts of mine on oh, no. there. So follow me on Instagram if you really want to see what I'm posting at Kristen Toomey. Kristen, thanks for doing the podcast. I really appreciate thanks, it. Thanks, Paul. Thanks this for being is good. awesome. I feel like I'm productive today. There you go. And thank you all for listening or watching. Go to sleep.